Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2024 kickoff Synchron LinkedIn Live. That's a mouthful. Um, thank you to everyone joining today. It's going to be a great discussion. So I hope everyone sticks around and you will want to stick around because we have a announcement at the end. So, um, yeah. Stick around. Um, to everyone joining us today, this is a great opportunity to interact with our speakers. This is, you know, what we want is for the audience to ask questions, comment, give your thoughts. So just do that right in the comments section and our speakers will do their best to um, answer your questions or address your comments as we go. Um, with that, I'll just pass it on. Um, let's do some just really quick bios, um, introduce yourself, and I will start with Mark today. Hey, Justin. Thank you very much. Mark Homer. Uh, I live near Oxford in the UK. So great to be with all you. Uh, been in the supply chain field service for 35 years. Uh, I'm a managing partner of Field Service Associates. So great to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Hart. I work with Mark, managing partner of Field Service Associates. Um, 40 years uh, in field service and supply chain. So um, thus all the gray wings that you can see. So looking forward to the discussion. Hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, Justin Konopask here with Synchron, Director of Industry Solutions. Uh, excited for this conversation and to kick off a great year. All right, and hi everyone. I'm Sarang Sambari. I'm part of our industry solutions team at Synchron. Uh, not as much experience as Dave or Mark. I, I have about 17 years in the service supply chain and field service space, but look, very excited for our first uh, LinkedIn Live of the year, guys. Happy New Year to everyone, by the way. Uh, and this one is a, is a big topic, right? Eliminating uh, service surprises or, or trying to understand what we can do to eliminate service surprises. And look, before we jump into the discussion, I have a story. And guys, I don't think I've ever told you this one before. And look, this goes back uh, probably about 12 years now. And I was doing a consulting engagement. And look, I'm, I'm going to leave out all the company names. And it, it, like, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to not get anyone in trouble for this one. But I'll, I'll tell you the story. Um, so yeah, about 12 years ago, I was doing a consulting engagement with a large OEM that manufactured uh, servers. And one of their uh, high priority end customers was a major movie production company. And this movie production company was getting ready to release a brand new summer sort of blockbuster movie. Uh, it was one of these uh, action hero sort of movies. And, uh, you know, the editing team was doing some final adjustments, final updates to, to the movie. And one of the servers uh, ended up going down. And so it was a massive problem. You know, they've got the team there over the weekend that's working on making some final adjustments because the movie is going to get released the following weekend, or I think it was like uh, about a week and a half out. And look, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong with this one. First, when they created the work order to have somebody come on site and, and fix this server, the work order got prioritized the wrong way. So the dispatchers did not even see this work order come in for hours. Right? This is something that probably has a two or four hour SLA to get parts and a technician on site. And someone hasn't even seen this in four hours. Uh, and then once they finally got it and saw that this was a high priority work order, they dispatched the technician. The technician went on site and surprise, surprise, they did not have the parts that they needed to be able to fix this job. And it gets worse, right? All of the surrounding stocking locations or even when they looked at inventory that other technicians might have, um, they couldn't find the part anywhere. And so, you know, a job that probably should have taken, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to complete ended up taking the whole weekend to complete. And this means that the editing team could not work on this movie, 
right? This is a job that probably should have cost maybe under a thousand dollars in parts and labor. But because of this delay, because the editing team couldn't make all their adjustments to this movie, they ended up having to delay the release of this movie. And so a thousand dollar job turned into a multi-million dollar work order. So that's my story. We got to figure out how do we eliminate this? Of course, this is the extreme case. But look, all of you have so much experience. I'm, I'm sure you've had similar sorts of scenarios. Justin, maybe I'll, I'll throw it over to you first. I mean, even just thinking about the, the aviation space, I hope there's not too many uh, service surprises, but I've been on enough delayed flights to know that's not a reality. What's, what's your take on this? Uh, I mean, you're, you're spot on, Sarang. Um, as you can imagine, aircraft are very large, complex assets, uh, a lot of moving parts, a lot of parts that can break and uh, oftentimes do require maintenance or service. Um, and, you know, when, when, when the aircraft is in service, you know, your, your airlines behind the scenes, the operations for flight operations, they're, <clears throat> they're counting on that aircraft being available at given locations. And so, you know, depending on the airline, they may have a spare aircraft or two that's kind of ready to go on standby. But a lot of times when you have, you know, one delay or you have to pull one aircraft out of service, there's a waterfall effect associated with it. So to your point, it's not necessarily just that one situation, that one visit, but it cascades downstream. So that's why oftentimes, like, I always try to fly first thing in the morning because usually the aircraft are stationed at the airport where they were overnight and there's low risk of a delay kind of cascading downstream. Whereas if you try to fly later at night, uh, that's where a lot of times something that happened earlier in the day can impact that, you know, downstream play. So it's when the aircraft is like in service, a lot of times it's just, you know, try to troubleshoot it really quick. If it's a systems issue, if you need to replace a component, um, you got to have that board stocking location, you know, readily available for those high risk components, if you will, the things that are just going to kind of more routinely require replacement. Um, and then at the end of the day, you got to make a judgment call. You know, how long do you actually try to work that aircraft before you pull it out of service and swap another one in and start changing routes, everything. So I think the, the service surprises that you may experience in aviation uh, cast a much wide, wider net than most people anticipate because of the complex, you know, web that is a flight operations network on any given day. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, maybe if we can open it up to the larger group, but why don't we first just start with, can we identify all the different things that we're talking about when we say service surprises, right? What are all, what are all the things that, that could go wrong? And mind you, we only have, what, 45 minutes for this yeah. call. So let's, let's keep it to a consolidated, consolidated oh, yeah. list. There's loads. Yeah, was, Absolutely loads. So, yeah, was, it, yeah, interesting, isn't it? What, what Justin said there. Do you ever find when things go wrong, they just, it's like a snowball effect. If it can go wrong, it does go wrong. Um, you know, you, you were talking about that scenario before, Sarang. I remember years ago, we had one of our biggest clients for a company I used to work for, and, and they had multiples of our machines. And these were million dollar pieces of equipment. And we just outsourced our, our whole supply chain to a third party logistics company and moved all of our in-house inventory over uh, to try and get a better level of service. And our service engineer uh, rang me one day and said, look, this this line is down, which you know, immediately rings alarm bells in the organization. It was escalating to me immediately. I had the customer straight on the phone and the engineer ordered the part that he needed. He needed a new shaft for this particular machine. So we expedited the part. We had it flown out there same day, which as you can imagine is horribly expensive. And the engineer called me and said, hey, it's not a shaft. They've sent me a belt. And it was like, so you can imagine the customers on the phone. So we reordered the part expedited that night it arrives the following morning and they send yet another belt so at this point you can imagine like it's just exploding and i i got on with our internal supply chain folks uh i was on with the third party logistics provider the service engine and i were all on this kind of call together and the third party logistics provider said look we've been down to the bin location and we've picked exactly the part you've ordered and it's a belt and we said, well, we're looking for the shaft. So you guys have obviously put it in the wrong area. 
and they said, well, we wouldn't know the difference between a belt and a shaft. And our internal uh, supply chain guy said, well, listen, I've got an idea for you. Walk down to the line, pick the part up and smash yourself over the head with it. And if it hurts, you've definitely got a shaft. And if it doesn't, you've definitely got the belt, which was a bit of a, you know, a, a sort of archaic way of doing it. But it was just an example where you just can't preempt things like that. And unfortunately, as a service leader, you've got to recognize it's almost impossible to try and plan for all eventualities like that. You've just got to work through them systematically and eventually weed out a lot of the issues that you have. And then eventually, you know, hopefully you have an organization that's um, that's pretty up to the mark. That's certainly my experience anyway. Dave, is it fair to say then as a service leader, I mean, you almost have to look at your business from the perspective of someone who has never worked in service and, and understand, okay, how would they look at this? How are they going to be able to support my business and almost anticipate where things could go wrong or anticipate where people might not understand the needs of your business? Yeah, in this particular case, we we then do some root cause analysis and it just it was human error. Effectively, the bin was put in the wrong location. And of course, when you outsource something like that, you 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 do lose the internal expertise. Somebody reads the picture sheet and sees it's a shaft and they pull a belt out. Somebody who's had 20 years experience working for the company would know the difference. But when it's outsourced like that, sometimes those kind of mistakes happen. And then you effectively have to do a root and branch review of why that particular mistake happened and then go do an audit with the third party logistics provider in this case to make sure that's never going to happen again. But it's, it's that knock on effect I'm talking about. You know, these things just snowball out of control. And you, you do look incredibly second rate in front of your client. It's very, very hard uh, to explain to them exactly what's gone on. As far as they're concerned, you know, you made a business decision to outsource your logistics provider. You know, that's on you. And then, you know, obviously in, in this particular case, penalty clauses kicked in and we ended up paying a significant penalty to that particular client. Mark, I'm curious your take on on one thing. The um, sometimes I start to see that the surprises are already being created even before somebody goes uh, on site to work on something. What I mean by this is, I mean, how are service organizations even thinking about what type of service should they be doing? What that should they not be doing? What's covered under a contract or not covered, or covered under a warranty or not covered? What's been your experience with with those sorts of scenarios? Uh, well, so I start my morning sort of watching breakfast TV, the, the proper breakfast TV at five o'clock in the morning before the sort of the, the dumbed down version comes in at six. <laughs> and it's amazing how many things that you spot. Do you remember that awful moment was eating my cornflakes and I noticed the Suez Canal was blocked all of a sudden by a container ship. It's amazing how real world events affect every day, but essentially contracts warranty solutions the way that you package you know services um over a long term perhaps um you can price them in a particular way and it's amazing how world events when we think about like the cost of working capital has really sort of had a big impact for all of us it's amazing how those pricing decisions you might have made two years ago or even a year ago are currently underwater almost you know your margins are affected because of sort of the volatility in the supply chain you know the shortage of certain components um and some of the critical sort of contracts that rely on certain critical SKUs um all of a sudden not being available therefore you can't meet the service level agreements therefore you know it's the modeling i think it's the modeling it's the ability to see a problem and then to be able to understand what that impact is on you what the risk is and that's the hard thing i think it's that agility to do that which is really the thing that I worry about most. So I think to ask the question, yeah, you know, you can package things, market things in the current world, but the way that our users at the moment and all the different things that are affecting sort of the world order and, and things, it has an impact on us, you know, almost immediately, or sometimes it's a delayed impact. As Dave said, it's that cumulative effect. But of course, then you've got to answer questions like, you know, why is your margin eroding? You've got to be able to sort of model that and explain why all of a sudden overnight your expedited parts costs have gone up through the roof because people are shipping uh, urgent parts to meet service agreements. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it probably still shocks us today, but, you know, just how many... Um, 
in different organizations are not even updating their price lists for their service parts yeah. components, you know, every six months or every quarter, uh, especially with, you know, how many, how much, how much things have changed, uh, with, with the costs, right? Um, it's almost weekly, isn't it? It's almost like you've got to really think about it, particularly sort of, you know, particularly high moving parts, you know? Yep. So it's, it's ability to understand what's going on. So sometimes, you know, it's broader than our, our sort of domain are the world that we control you know our internal organization is sometimes understanding sort of the the economic and the macroeconomic factors that are going to affect us down the line you know even the news yesterday you know you, you think oh it's really interesting you know all the different things that are affecting all sorts of things you know yeah, yeah you know, I know. that point Sarang, you, you mentioned before about you know pricing and so on you think about a company with hundreds of thousands or even millions of SKUs Mm -hmm. um, they're now getting, in some cases, weekly or monthly price updates from their suppliers. It's it's an absolute minefield trying to keep track on. I mean, a lot of companies historically, you know, we're getting price increases maybe once a year. And although the process may be painful in your organization, updating prices on an Excel spreadsheet once a year and uploading them back into a system is painful but doable. But, you know, when you try and do that on a weekly or biweekly or even monthly basis, I mean, that's just incredibly painful. And, and the second thing you mentioned before, you mentioned about entitlements. I think there's a very interesting dynamic that goes on. We often say that, you know, service engineers are trusted advisors of, of for their customers, right? Um, the old adage of, you know, the service engineer always tells the truth and has a tremendous relationship with your customer. But you put a service engineer in a situation where they're unsure about exactly what the customer's entitled to, you, you can bet, you know, you know, any amount of dollars that the service engineer is always going to err on the side of the customer normally. If in yeah. doubt, don't charge. Uh, that's typically what service engineers will do. So if you have an entitlement system where you, you don't have those uh, integrations into your financial system, so the service engineer is incredibly clear exactly what that customer is entitled to, what's covered under warranty, what isn't, what does the entitlement, you know, exactly allow the customer to receive or not to receive, if there's any doubt in an engineer's mind, more often than not, they'll do that service for free or give that part away for free. And I don't think companies can afford to take those kind of risks these days, especially with the dynamics that Mark was talking about before. When you look at the increasing pricing, some of the delays happening in supply chain right now, these are the kind of leakages that we see in organizations that are all too often that they really need to stop putting a stop to, really. Yeah. Dave, I, I remember years ago, I was working with an organization and I, I was shadowing someone who was in charge of managing service contracts. And they also uh, had a team that was creating work orders. And I, I, you know, I just asked them a simple question. I said, all right, when you create a work order, how do you determine is this covered under the service contract or not covered under uh, the service contract? I remember, I, you know, while shadowing this person, uh, she said, Sarang, come on, come, come follow me. And I said, all right, where are we going? We walked out of her office into another office. She opened up a big filing cabinet and she pulled out a paper service contract. And she said, okay, you can flip through this and try to figure out if this is covered or not covered under a service contract. Again, an extreme case, and, and this organization has made a lot of updates over the years. But uh, you're absolutely right, Dave. There's there's definitely confusion in that space sometimes. Yeah, I mean, Sarang, one of the reasons why I made a decision to change our service system many years ago was that our service engineers had a 13-string alpha numeric uh, entitlement bar that used to come up on their PDAs. And yeah. I went out with an engineer when I first joined this organization. I said, oh, OK, explain what they mean. And he was like, uh, this one, I think, means they're on a gold contract, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think this element here is the response time. But again, I, you know, it was kind of like, and I went into the leadership meeting and I put this alphanumeric string on the display and got all of the service managers around me and said, guys, somebody explain what this means to me, because I've just been out with an engineer that's confused. And I got like 10 different answers in the room. It's like, okay, this sucks. I mean, we cannot have our service engineers in any kind of doubt about exactly. Because imagine the situation from a client's perspective. You get one visit where the engineer says, it's all covered under your contract. Thanks very much indeed. Nothing to pay. The next visit, the service engineer says, hey, this is chargeable. 
it's incredibly confusing for the client. You know, it, it destroys any kind of relationship you have, and you just can't afford to make those mistakes in service. Dave, is it a nice point to maybe transition? Let's let's look at the customer side of this uh, as well. I mean, as what is the the end goal? Is it is it eliminating uh, service surprises, or is that is that a, a goal that we will you know maybe never yeah. achieve? And and like as we look at customers. I think you know most service organizations have made significant improvements over the past even you know five to seven years, but it seems like customer expectations are growing and growing and growing. I mean, what what's your read on the customer side of this? Always demanding, so, always demanding. <laughs> yeah, Get, and and yeah, think, uh, expectations are definitely increasing. Um, but I I think simply put, Serang to kind of level set, at least the way that I view customer expectations is, you know, th there's, there's no question that maintenance is required on assets, especially the ones that we work with. They're complex, they have long life cycles. There's a lot of moving components with wear and tear. It's just inevitable. Um, the service surprise aspect really comes down to how do I eliminate as much unplanned maintenance as humanly possible? Planned maintenance is okay. I don't want any unplanned maintenance. I want to operate, you know, seamlessly between cycles. And then when I do have unplanned maintenance, how do I resolve it as quickly as possible? And that's where I think you're seeing that shift in customer expectations. You're going from weeks to days, days to hours, hours to minutes. Everything is shrinking. And a lot of it comes down to just the increase in technological advancements like that were taking place. We have phones where everything is on demand for us, like right in front of us. Why can't I get an answer? Why can't I get this resolved today? Um, that's just becoming more and more of the expectation. So you have the time to repair basically that you need to adjust for. And then additionally on the entitlement side is I don't want any surprises in what I'm paying. And that goes for planned and unplanned because I, I can have a great experience for planned maintenance with my Jeep. I can bring it into the dealer. They can give me a loaner car immediately. They can give me some refreshments. They can have a great communication via text, just letting me know every step of the way updates. You know, they can brief me on entitlements along the way as well. Hey, this is covered. We found this issue. It's going to run exactly this part. Do we have a green light to go? Awesome. Like that's a great experience. There are no surprises. To flip that on its head, if I go into the Jeep dealership, I don't have a loaner car. I'm sitting in the waiting room. They find more stuff. And now they need my car for several days, if not a week. I have no idea what the pricing is. I'm waiting at home. They don't call me. They don't communicate. They call me at the end of the week, say, hey, your car is ready. I come back into the dealer. And all of a sudden, the bill is $3,000 when I was expecting it to be $300. That's a service surprise. That's a planned maintenance visit that was I was OK with that then turned into a surprise for me. So it's it's interesting when you kind of look at it through that paradigm of just the little things along the way can really make a big difference in eliminating those surprises. And I, I I've always been a big proponent of um, it when I worked in the you know in industry and service is go ugly early. You know when when you have issues when you find issues transparency is your friend because it just gets worse with time it festers it's not a good situation. So I think there's a lot of truth to that that can eliminate the surprises because inevitably things happen and there's nothing we can do about it. And it's just transparency and collaboration that's going to you know need to take place. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's, it's like designing for availability and clearly what customers want yep. is availability at the very lowest cost. But I think now you've got to take a view, you've got to design for resilience. It's all about how can you deliver a resilient sort of service and how can you mitigate the risks you know you're never going to cover all your risks but there are certainly things that you can plan for and that relies on granular sort of view of data you know really looking at every single thing that makes up that service proposition and working through the contingency plans uh, and and that's that takes time but that's probably the only way of actually dealing you know and delivering that greater experience and clearly through the pandemic you know customers have did a lot of their own work and of course that's educated them so i think they're also looking for more education more support from ourselves you know uh, you know and at the point of service particularly i think technicians certainly younger technicians are looking for greater help greater support greater 
visibility of what they've got to do or the task in hand and and trying to eliminate some of the gotchas so we very much talk about resilience we very much talk about getting things done first time right so the first time you do something you do it right uh, and and deliver a complete experience mark i'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you made there you know you, know, you oh. talked about sorry the cold the sort of cold hard ugly truth um i i think in my experience i i, I just couldn't agree with you anymore I've never known a customer yet that doesn't like the cold, hard, ugly truth. They may not like it. They may they may you know hate the fact that something's going horribly wrong. But but nobody wants to you know to be hoodwinked. Nobody wants to you know have false hope. So for me, I've always been an advocate of just telling it straight. You know, so we have a problem, and your machine is not going to be up and running. All right, it's going to be tomorrow afternoon at the earliest. Just give them the bad news up front. Yes, they're going to kick and scream. But I've never known anybody yet that's come back to me and said, you know, I really wish you hadn't have told me that. More often than not, they make their own contingencies internally because they know exactly then what's going on. And, and to your point, Sarang, customers are far more informed than they've ever been. You know, you look yeah. at some of the products out there now, things like customer portals. You know, they can look at billing history. They can go and look at their own entitlement. You know exactly what they're entitled to now. They can track their own service engineer, you know, where he is, how long it's going to take before he gets to me. They're more informed, they're more empowered than they've ever been. So I think the need for truth and honesty is one of the great ways of eliminating service surprises. Don't give people false hope is what I'm saying. Tell them the truth, even though it's ugly. And then between the two of you, work on a way of how you're going to get through these next few hours or days or whatever it is. And I think customers respect organizations that deal with them in that way. Guys, I'm, I'm going to challenge you for a minute here. What about the flip side of this? Let's say I do eliminate service surprises. Let's say I, I do eliminate, for the most part, uh, unplanned downtime. What happens on the customer side now? You know, I'm, I'm, I haven't seen my technician ever. This machine is is up and running. It's perfect. You know, yeah. I don't have any problems. What do I even need this service contract? For? What am I paying for? Exactly. What yeah. am I paying for? Yeah. How do I? How do I? How do I bridge that gap, right? How, how do I still show the value of this organization? You know, customer, look, your machine is up and running because we've been here and we've been doing all this sort of activity. Uh, we just didn't have to bother you about it. Well, exactly that. You have to educate them what you're doing, yeah. even, even if they don't see it. And that's quite typical, you know. So again, sort of prescriptive ideas, you know, giving them advice, guidance. Um, as Dave said, you know, the trusted trusted advisor in the technician, you know, to a lot of the time they're, they're giving advice, particularly when product or equipment is coming to end of life. So, you know, but um, yeah, you have to, you know, when things are going well, you have to communicate the fact that they're going well and uh, and explain why they're going well, from what service or what, or what support you're providing. Absolutely. And you, I've had those conversations where people say, well, you know, what am I paying for? You know, uh, <laughs> And you've got to be careful that, you know, if you have a tiered offer like a bronze, silver, gold, that you don't give gold service, but charge for bronze or charge for silver. You know, you need to make sure that, again, the people in the entire organization know the, the boundaries of the particular service offering. And I think you know, it's already been talked about, you know, from a marketing point of view, these offerings change. So, again, it can become very confusing very fast. And, uh, and particularly when sort of uh, technicians, you know, that's sort of, generation of technicians sort of leaving the business and uh, you've got new new people come on that perhaps don't know some of the, the legacy packages that the customers were familiar with over the last 10 years so that that's the challenge in itself so it's all about you know communication it's all about um, explaining that and, and I, I push that resilience piece you know it's all about offering a resilient service that clearly you can articulate the value and, and demonstrate the value when you're challenged on on your quarterly business reviews or your your annual customer sort of interaction Mark, what that's where the point, is Mark, isn't it? it? It's it's demonstrating the value surround to your point. Um, because if you're doing things in the background, if you're doing a lot of remote service, for example, or you know, you've got an IoT play and you can see how a product's performing, you can see that potentially a part's gonna fail, the next routine service that the customer's expecting, the engineer's in there replacing a part before it fails. It all looks really seamless. There's a hell of a lot of pedaling that goes on in the background. But from a client's perspective, it's like, well, you know, I'm paying for a breakdown service and you guys come in once every three months and just service my product. So I don't know why I'm paying for this gold standard support when I don't really need it. And yeah. I think to Mark's point, it's all about education, man. And this is a dichotomy I think a lot of service leaders are facing right now. They're utilizing technology. 
they're improving uptimes through it, but customers are not seeing any perceived value because they don't see a body on site. Uh, what they've got, of course, is a much higher uptime and their product actually working, but they don't connect that with the value that they're paying for a service contract. And I think, you know, again, to Mark's point, it's all about education. You've got to make sure that when the engineer goes in there, you just try and get to somebody and say, listen, we've been remotely monitoring your product. We can see that this was going to fail. I have this part with me. I've changed it today. Shouldn't cause you any issues. It's all of that kind of stuff. But it is hard to do. I think the technology yeah. Yeah. is making this, you know, so we can give much higher uptimes. But the connection to value is the problem here. And, and we talk to a lot of service leaders that are saying, they're getting customers demanding a reduction in price because they don't see a human being there as much as they used to do. What they don't realize is the investment this company's made in the background to elevate to this level of service. And I think over time, you know, clients will eventually come to understand the, the, the perceived value that they're getting, but it, it's just a matter of time. Dave, when you were running service, did you, I mean, did you have the ability to be able to go back to your customers every quarter or maybe a couple of times a year and say, hey, you know, based off all the data that we're seeing, if you didn't have this service contract in place, here is what y your cost would have been. And because you have it in place, this is what your cost is. Yeah, yeah not, not, not so much, Sarang. I, I, I've come across very few service organizations that, that can get to that level of granularity mm -hmm. from a contract perspective. But we did have a great report, which was called a customer account review report. And quarterly, I would insist that our service leaders went into their very large clients. And it would have things like, you know, the model, the serial number, locations, uh, the number of breakdowns, how many courtesy visits we did, which I think is really important because you say to them, look, there's been X number of times we've been in and just done a courtesy visit on your product just to make sure everything's up and running. And then things like, you know, uptime is in there as well. And effectively, you're just reinforcing to the client that there's an awful lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. You know, I often call it the, you know, the, the, the swan-like approach. You know, on the surface, it looks very graceful, but underneath the organization's paddling like crazy. But again, it's, it's demonstrating to your customer that there's an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes to make sure that they get a high level of service. So that was a very useful report that we use quite a lot. Justin, what about you? Anything that you took back to your customers? So the, there's actually something different that comes to mind we haven't really touched on right now, and it um, has to do with how defense contracts are actually set up for service in many situations. So earn value management is a project management uh, methodology that's traditionally used for you know actually new product development. Um, but a lot of contracts with governments are actually structured by EVM, earned value management. And so you have a given time period for that service contract, like five years. And then you have quarterly reviews with them to show everything that you've done and the value associated with it to their fleet. And your measures can either be asset availability, it can be cost, like there's a, a slew of different ways you can slice and dice this. But it's interesting that that uh, methodology, which is very uncommon, more on the public or commercial side, is actually quite relevant in the government side because they have such rigor around the spending associated with the, you know, what's being funded, you know, essentially. So, that, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, do you, so do you see maybe many service organizations, depending on the industry, changing the way or shifting the way that they look at their metrics like okay great we've got our first time fixed rates our mean time yeah. to repair we've got our, our <laughs> fill rates on the inventory side i'm not saying yeah. that we're gonna stop tracking that but what do we need to think about for the future yeah, i you know, I, I, I'm I'm not a I'm not recommending everyone shift to EVM. I'll caveat that because that's you know a little <laughs> bit on the other side of the spectrum there. But sure. there's definitely a, a methodology shift, I believe, where the measures of success are now more so tied to, uh, we'll say, performance of the assets themselves. Um, and I think avail you know whatever that be uh, availability, schedule reliability. Um, you know, uptime cycles, uh, you know, you can kind of choose your own flavor, if you will, depending on what industry and what your customers are looking for. Um, but I think as technology advances, that's part of the benefit here is that it, it's not one size fits all across every industry and every customer, um, because the customers downstream are ultimately going to be different. And so uh, what 
what that means to me, I'll, I'll use, you know, automobiles as an example. Um, you know, there, there's several large players in the United States that are shifting the way that they're measuring their own success. And so when they're looking at supply chains, you know, traditionally you might look at fill rates, you might look at, you know, inventory costs, trying to balance this. Now it's shifting more towards service levels and then even with their own measures of like, what's the percent same day, like repair, yeah. meaning that, you know, customer comes in, I have the parts, I have everything I need, customers out the same day. Yeah. So you're changing it and shifting the measures downstream, which ultimately is going to drive that better business practice, if you will. It's interesting you bring up the automotive example, Justin. I, I, I believe that service organizations could even use this from a marketing standpoint, right? If I'm an, and an, yep. like, you know, I have my car, let's say, let's say I have a, you know, a Toyota vehicle, right? Um, uh, if I hear something in a commercial that says, you know, Toyota has the, the best fill rates, that doesn't mean much to me. But yeah. if I hear in some sort of commercial that I can get same day service by bringing my car into a Toyota dealership, now that means something to me. Yeah, I mean, you can start making, uh, you can start making marketing messaging align with what you can perform at. And, you know, I mean, obviously this is, I, I know, I don't know if this is possible or if anyone would do it, but like something that comes to mind is like, look, you know, buy a Toyota and, you know, we'll guarantee same day service or 50% off or something like that. You start out offering those types of entitlements associated with it because you're that confident. You know, airlines do that with their bags a lot of times, actually. They have service levels from the time the plane reaches the gate to the time you get your bag off the conveyor belt. If it happens over a certain period of time, you're entitled to like flight coupon, basically. But the, the challenge with a lot of these things is that it's difficult to model the risk, isn't it? Because a lot of sort of your traditional ERP systems don't really go granular enough for the aftermarket for our, for our industry. Yep. So we're forever sort of extracting data and modeling it in various, you know, like Excel sort of modeling tools. You know, you, you really want to be able to get at the data to model it. So you can you can look at your stock out position, you can look at your cost of freight, you can balance your inventory holding to sort of meet these sort of demands. And that's that's quite challenging, you know, with, with certainly certain tools. I mean, the earlier questions around which like, you know, if you've got a customer report, I mean, again, to be ability to respond to a customer's need for data and to report that again in an agile way is quite critical. So I think that ability to visualize that to, to respond to a customer, you know, is quite hard to do in the traditional sort of uh, IT landscape that perhaps you know, many colleagues find themselves in. But I love the fact, Mark, that technology now is changing the the whole marketplace. So Justin and I were talking about. This. You know, a few months ago, I, I flew with a, let, let's call it a large carrier and had the pleasure of flying at the front of the plane, which was very nice. Uh, arrived at my destination and found out that my bags hadn't turned up and got told I had two choices, either wait three days for them to follow me or wait until the next flight came in. And luckily for me, I had enough of a delay to catch my next flight that I ended up waiting in the baggage hall for another three hours for my bags to turn up. But when I checked them into the next airline, I flew with a low cost airline and this was in the US. Um, I got free Wi-Fi on the plane, which I, I didn't get on the other carrier, even though I was flying up front. And I got a text from them to let me know that my bags had been safely boarded onto the plane, which I didn't get with the large national carrier. So it's amazing how technology is really changing the landscape. And some of these low cost airlines now are providing what is a really premier service through the ability of software, which I think is incredible. It's a real differentiator. And the ability to integrate software quickly into your existing platform and then deliver value very quickly like that is incredible. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, let's let's go a little bit deeper into the technology side of things. I and mean, we started off our session today with identifying a number of different uh, service surprises. but. Let's talk a little bit about how how do you leverage different technology on the market today to help that that sort of battle of, of eliminating these service surprises. There's so much technology out there, right? What do you use? How, how do you use it? And what could have the biggest impact to your organization when you think about these surprises? 
I think that's part of the challenge, Sarang, is that um, this equation is so large and there's so many moving components that it's hard just to get started. Um, and, you know, Mark, you'd mentioned, you know, the, the, the systems that are currently in place, you know, ERP, CRMs and whatnot, like a lot of these have been in place for many years, if not decades to a certain extent. And so processes, people, technology have all been aligned to a traditional way of thinking. But I, I think, you know, the, the way that I kind of describe it, the, the way that I visualize this or break it down is you kind of have three buckets almost. You have uh, parts, you have pricing, and you have entitlements. You know, th those are the three things that at least jump out to me as offering the biggest surprises. Um, obviously, there's whole field service as well with respect to uh, enabling technicians, first time fixed rate, et cetera. But a lot of those three can be managed, um, I'll say, independently of one another to a certain extent. You know, you can just focus on really refining your entitlement process. Like Dave was describing earlier, you had that, you know, 13 digit code that no one understood you simplify that, the problem is essentially eliminated. You know, pick one thing, tackle it, get really good at it, and then expand from there. Whether that is one uh, vertical in terms of the process, the way that I just broke it down, or maybe, and this is something that I experienced in aerospace, is that the newer products coming to market largely had better data associated with it. So what I mean by that is like a 787, a newer aircraft, has a lot more information, a lot better supply chain. They were starting to go down the path of like blockchain technology as well, compared to like a 757 that's been in service for you know 40 years, basically. Legacy designs, legacy supply chain, everything's paper. You know, that's the you know, going to the back and seeing what the entitlements are in the binder, basically, that type of situation. So, you know, you can't solve everything for every product for your entire organization. But just picking a place that gives you the best chance of success to like pilot to make that first step and just start moving, you know, in that direction. And you, inevitably you're going to learn. And I think that's honestly what handcuffs so many service leaders is you think you need to roll out this A to Z, you know, journey across the next five to 10 years of how you're going to transform your organization down to the, you know, T's crossed and I's, I's dotted. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to move north. Pick something and start moving north. That's the you know the methodology that I've always had. You want to pick something that has you know, it's not fail quickly, but you know our chief product officer here, Sean. I, I love this room. It's you know everyone has always said fail quick, but he says fail cheap, and I think that's a key differentiator there with respect to how you want to fail because normally quick is cheap, but you can also be quick and expensive too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start using that from now on. But um, you know. I, I think that's that's something that just comes to mind is like if you're gonna, you know, need to need to be move north, you have an outline of where you're headed, and from there, just make sure you're not getting too far away from going north, and ultimately you're going to be adding value along the way. You want to deliver incremental value. You don't want to wait five years and then do you know flip a switch for a transformation because we've all been there. We all know how that goes, and it's usually a disaster. Yeah. I, I would I like your, your points. I'd add clarity and accuracy to it as well. Just to sort of say, be very clear, um, you know, that clarity of thought, you know, and use data and get accurate data on knowing what probably you're going to focus on. But I totally agree, you know, agile short duration projects focus on a particular area. I mean, something Perfect. a lot of our clients are looking at at the moment is looking at pricing because obviously the volatility yeah. in the market, pricing is a critical thing and you can do a lot with pricing. You know, you you can sort of use pricing as a strategy to do certain things. Like you can, you can price things particularly to get you know for higher price to sort of manage you know manage high moving parts. You can sort of prevent stock outs. You can look at sort of legacy uh, parts. You know, they're coming to end of life. You can price them accordingly. A lot of people are not. They, they tend to take a broad brush approach rather than sort of focusing on particular SKUs and doing the right analysis. I know it takes time, but it have a, can have a dramatic effect on the organisation. Um, it, again and of course this all takes time to to model it and take data out of systems and things but again if you can expedite that process um that's really going to be very powerful i think yeah what what else so we've talked a little bit about the technology side what about from the business side of things what what can these service organizations look at uh changes that they might want to make uh within their business to help eliminate some of these service surprises, right? Because it can't just be technology. 
No, I guess I guess they they have to look at process as well. And and for me, one of the biggest issues with a lot of service companies is relevance within their own companies. It's about having that sort of voice at the C-suite that becomes really important. And as as organisations are, are pushing towards more of a an outcome based or servitized approach to the way that they interact with their own customers. It's a, it's about um, almost getting noticed at, at the C-suite. I'm seeing a lot a lot more service leaders are, are going into role that don't necessarily have a service background, which I think is really encouraging. I really like mm-hmm. to see that. It brings that sort of fresh approach. But I'm also seeing a lot of companies, you know, that they're, they're really adverse now to doing big bang changes to their IT infrastructure. They're looking yeah. for... They're looking for a modular approach. It's, you know, uh, get, get me well, but get me well fast. Show me something that's going to get a return on investment that, that's very quick. You know, CFOs these days, I think Mark made the point earlier on, you know, the, the cost of capital is expensive now. I mean, before capital was so cheap, companies were borrowing for virtually nothing. And those days are gone. So those investments now have to be well thought out. Obviously, they have to be justified, but they need a really quick return on investment. So the ability for service leaders to be noticed at senior levels within their organization to push forward their agenda about the change that they want and not to have a massive implication to to the IT landscape a, a lot of i mean you talk to a lot of companies now and IT have projects for the next 5 or 6 years so to be able to shoehorn something in that's going to give demonstrable value to your end customer that gives you a very quick return on investment are the kind of investments we're certainly seeing at the moment that are, are getting very much the green light in organizations. These sort of big bang approaches, I, I just don't think are working anymore. But Dave, if you're like, let's say you're focused on a new initiative, um, what do you lead with? Do you lead with looking at your process and thinking about some changes? Do you lead with technology? Is it a mix? Um, what role does the technology vendor play in you know, what you might be changing from a business standpoint? What's What's your read on that? Yeah, I think um, you need to choose a technology vendor that's that's proven, I think, in their field. Uh, I, I look for proven track record. I look for, you know, great customer recommendations. I want to see where you've done this before. I want to know that you've built those APIs and they're sturdy. They work. Uh, you know, there's no real issues with them. Um, I, I kind of don't want to be first. I, I don't want to be bleeding edge, that's for sure. You know, I want somebody else to have suffered all the cuts and bruises. Um, you know, so <laughs> from, from my perspective, I'm a little bit risk adverse with things like that because I've been at the bleeding edge. I understand, uh, you know, what benefits that can bring, certainly, but it also comes with a bunch of headaches as well. So that's kind of my approach. So I don't know if you guys. I mean, what about that. what about even bringing technology vendors into um, sort of your your. I guess bringing them in closer to your business in the evaluation process. Like, should you have technology vendors spending time on site with you know your inventory planners and your um, you know your pricing managers or the people on the field service side of your business? Is that is that worth the time? I mean, it's 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 you know it's time that your organization has to spend with these organizations, but is it worth it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the simple answer is yes. But also, you've got to remember that um, most organizations are incredibly myopic because all they know is their own organization. Sometimes, sure. you know, the blinkers are on and they don't really see what else is going on. So I want to work with a vendor that will effectively lead me to best practice. Um, you know, I, I see many, many implementations where software vendors are kind of shoehorning their solution in and bending it into all kinds of weird shapes because of the way the organization has historically been run. And that, you know, that's not transformation effectively. That's just digitizing an, an old broken process. So I, I want to be led by the hand by a vendor. I want a vendor to come in and talk to me about best practice, what's worked in other organizations and where they've seen best practice deliver tangible results. And I think there's a combination somewhere in between of those two states that is the, the, the kind of perfect go forward scenario. Mark, yeah. just any thoughts? It's somewhere between what Justin said, like the agility, short duration products focused on delivery. So do something that makes a step change, but also working with a partner that you trust that has had that proven ability to deliver that. 
you know, the one quick yeah. way of getting noticed, certainly by the CFO and what have you, is have margin erosion <laughs> or, or suddenly yeah. find running, running an unprofitable business or, you know, you know you, you've you've lost X percentage points over the weekend or something. It's that sort of thing. You know, it's it's working with a vendor that understands ultimately the business that you are delivering and can work with you from an innovation point of view as well. But also recognize that you've got a day job, you know, and that you've got to deliver on that. And, and I said, I think it's more, you know, I keep harping on about resilience, but I think it's a great word because running a resilient, profitable business, there's nothing like it. So I, I want to work with a partner that realizes that, you know, the technology has got to work. The model's got to work. The expertise they bring has really got to genuinely move the dial, as Dave said. Um, yep. You know, so choose your partner wisely. And I guess that's critical. But I do like what Justin was saying, that more agile approach, you know lots of short duration projects very measurable and deliver value you know quickly because i think that also is the current name of the game at the moment you know no one's going to be whipping out sort of large systems but to complement those systems and to do some digital things in a you know I, I talked about first time right you know focusing on the customer and getting things right in a resilient way is, is the answer Justin, what about what about you? I mean, you've been in probably hundreds of, of these sorts of uh, technology presentations. Uh, let's let's close out with what what did you look for, right? What what put somebody a, a, a vendor ahead of um, somebody else? Uh, and then Dave, Mark, we're going to close out after this question, but start thinking about one final piece of advice that we're going to provide service <laughs> leaders. Go ahead, Justin. So there's one story that comes to mind when I was working through vendor selection um, in one of my old roles, and they came in and they were, you know, they were doing a demo. The old, you know, solution engineer was up there showing off all the flashy stuff, and it, the thing that jumped out at me is they called it the same exact thing that we had before, just like mm -hmm. 2.0, basically. It was like, you know, it, and the processes were the same. It was just they rebuilt it in the new system, more or less. And this was a support system. So a lot of it, all of the headaches that I had dealt with day in and day out for years were just now carried over to the new solution with just a new user interface, basically. And, you know, maybe slight tweaks here and there and better fields and that type of stuff. But, you know, I, I went over to the VP afterward and he's all jazzed up and excited. And I, he saw the look in my face and I just said, I'm like, why? why are you doing this? Why are you here? If I wanted to keep things the same, I would keep things the same. Yeah. He's like, what do you mean? I go, I want to see what you think we can do as a future state. I know you can do what we can do today or else I wouldn't be talking to you. And I think that's the thing that always jumped out at me when I was uh, looking for technology investments is that what's going to disrupt my business in a positive way going forward. And how are you taking those best practices and aligning it to what I'm doing today? Because it can't be, you know, a complete 180, but you can start shifting slowly. And that's what I wanted to see is how are they going to think about methodically that shift that needs to take place to take us to the next level of service, um, you know, yeah. service for our customers. Yeah. What's, what's the vision look like, right? What, what does my life look like um, yeah. moving forward? No, that's, that's, yeah. it's a great it's, point. You got to check the box today, though, first, but that should be a, a relatively quick conversation, I'll say. You got to show me the art of the possible and the best practices that you've already built in out of the box to your solution. That's the way that I approach it. Well, oh, man, the, the art of the possible presentations. I've, I've been a part of these before. I, I've seen <laughs> iPads thrown around rooms, sensors uh, thrown out doors. It's uh, yeah, that, that was an interesting that, presentation. That was kind of a loaded comment, I suppose. But it, it's, you know, art of the possible within reason. Because ultimately, yes. if you're just, if it's all fluff, like you don't want an engineer in an all fluff meeting because it will go very wrong for you very quickly. I'll, you know, I drilled into a number of solution engineers over my career and uh it unfortunately made them feel uncomfortable and that's just how they were trained to present but at the end of the day i want tangible and possible i i had this idea once justin while i was doing a presentation that i was going to have a drone fly into the room and land on the evps of service uh, land right on his desk and say look here's all the data that this drone has captured around this building, but I, I couldn't figure out the controls of this thing. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty quick. 
<laughs> guys, let's let's close out here. Um, Mark, why don't I start with you? One one final piece of advice. Uh, grow the course, so do the day job, but basically shine a bright light on what you're doing. Think about the black holes, the gotchas that could, could get you and get one of the team to start modeling that with real life data and you know innovation plan accordingly plan plan for the inevitable because it will get you in the end it's good really good advice dave what about you um yeah i look for vendors that you know i i say show me how uh, teach me uh, you're experts in your field so you know come and educate us we don't know all of the answers um i'd also say don't wait for it um, if you wait for IT in, in a service or supply chain uh, business, the chances are that they're, they're off, you know, working on very large projects. So sometimes I think you've got to bring uh, your own office to the table and try shoehorn some of these things in. I like what Justin said before. There's no golden bullet. So pick one thing and do it brilliantly and eventually just work your way through it. You, th these unplanned things are going to happen. It's just it's life, unfortunately. Who'd have known what's happened, you know, to Mark's point in the Red Sea? Fact that ships are now taking 20 days to go around the Cape. Uh, nobody can foresee those kind of things. But I think, you know, pick one thing, execute brilliantly, and move on to the next one. That would be something I would certainly encourage people to do. Good stuff. Yeah. One, one step at a time. Justin closes out here. You can't use that one, though. <laughs> uh, in the, you know, going back to the theme of this conversation, eliminating service surprises, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, promote transparency. Uh, what I mean by that is transparency internal and external. And so internal transparency is listen to your team that's actually doing the work because ultimately they're going to help you succeed in whatever transformation that's going forward. Uh, and then transparency, as we mentioned, externally, inevitably things are going to happen. And the quicker you rip off that Band-Aid and just get to a solution path, um, the better it is going to be for everyone. Love it. Love yeah, it. Right, I Gordon. think it's, it's so important. Guys, we want to thank you for for your time today. Great discussion. Uh, it's you know, like I said, I, I don't know if we'll ever get to a state where we completely eliminate service surprises, but I think we can be transparent, and I think uh, you know we can uh, you know take it one step at a time to to achieve that goal. Uh, look, just as a, a final note for the audience, I'm, I'm very excited to announce that Synchron is going to be launching a new ebook in February, and it's called "The Five Surprises That Could Derail Service Excellence." And look, if you talk to this group, there's going to be a lot more than five, but we we've tried to summarize it for you. So look out for that uh, launching in February. Hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarai. Thanks, everyone.